part two chapter nine of the friendship of christ by robert hugh benson this librivox recording is in the public domain part two christ in the exterior chapter nine christ in the sinner this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them luke chapter fifteen verse two we have considered how christ approaches us offering us his friendship under various forms and disguises placing within our reach that is to say certain aspects or even virtues and graces of himself which we cannot otherwise apprehend he extends for instance his priesthood to us in his human priest and his holiness in the saint both these particular disguises of his are simple enough to those who know anything of his reality as god it is actually only through some extraordinary prejudice or blindness that they fail to recognize the voice of the good shepherd in the words which his priest is authorized to pronounce or the sanctity of the most holy in the superhuman lives of his closest intimates it is not so easy to recognize him in the sinner as the sinner it would seem is the one character that he could not possibly assume even his dearest disciples seem to have at least been tempted to fail him when on the cross and yet more in gethsemane he that knew no sin for us was made sin two corinthians chapter five verse twenty one number one first however it is clear that among his most marked characteristics as recorded in the gospels were his friendship for sinners his extraordinary sympathy for them and his apparent ease in their company it was in fact for this very thing that fault was found with him who claimed as he did to teach a doctrine of perfection and yet if we think of it this characteristic of his is one of his supreme credentials for his divinity since none but the highest could condescend so low none but god would be so human on the one side there is no patronage as from a superior height this man receiveth sinners luke chapter fifteen verse two he is not content to preach to them he eateth with them as if on their level and on the other not a taint of the silly modern pose of unmorality his final message is always go and sin no more john chapter eight verse eleven so emphatic indeed is his friendship for sinners that it seems superficially as if comparatively he cared but little for the saints i am not come to call the just he says but sinners matthew chapter nine verse thirteen three times over in a single discourse he drives this lesson home to souls that are naturally prejudiced the other way since the chief danger of religious souls lies in phariseeism in three tremendous parables luke chapter fifteen the piece of silver lost in the house is declared more precious than the nine pieces in the money-box the single wilful sheep lost in the wilderness more valuable than the ninety-nine in the fold the rebellious son lost in the world more dear than the elder and the heir safe at home see too how he acted on what he said it is not merely a vague benevolence that he practises toward sinners in the abstract but a particular kindness toward sinners in the concrete he chooses out it seems the three types of all sin and unites them in a special manner to his company to the careless reckless thick-skinned villain he promises paradise 
to the hot-blooded passionate sensitive magdalen he gives absolution and praises her love and even that sinner most repulsive of all the deliberate cold-hearted traitor who prefers thirty shillings to his master he greets even in the very moment and climax of his treachery with the tenderest title of all friend says jesus christ whereto art thou come matthew chapter twenty six verse fifty one lesson emerges then from the gospel story clearly enough we cannot know christ in his most characteristic aspect until we find him among the sinners number two what however does this mean again and again the world revolts we can recognize our priest when he ministers at his altar our king of saints when he is transfigured we can even recognize him in a manner ministering to sinners since he ministers to ourselves but is there any intelligible sense in which we can say that he identifies himself with them in such a sense that we are to seek him in them and not merely amongst them yet the example of the saints is clear and unmistakable souls that are wholly united to christ seek nothing except christ and if one thing is plain it is that such souls whether they retire from the world to labor in penance and prayer or plunge into the world in effort and activity are seeking not merely things alien to christ that they may make them his but christ himself in a sense alien to himself that they may reconcile them after all it is very simple since christ is the light which enlighteneth every man coming into this world john chapter one verse nine and it is the presence of christ and that only that makes a human soul of any value certainly in one sense the soul lost in sin has lost christ his presence is no longer in the soul by grace yet in another sense and an appallingly real and tragic one christ is there still if a sinner merely drove christ away by his sin we could let such a soul go it is because in st paul's terrifying phrase the sinful soul holds christ still crucifying him and making him a mockery that we cannot bear to leave him to himself hebrews chapter six verse six such a soul has not yet entered hell nor yet lost finally and eternally the presence of god she is still in a state of probation and therefore still holds her saviour in mystical bonds and fetters there then our friend is not merely pleading with the soul externally but in a manner internally too there in the half stifled voice of conscience is the voice of jesus christ entreating through lips bruised once again there lies the light of the world crushed to a glimmering spark by a weight of ashes the absolute truth half silenced by falsehood the life of the world to come pressed to the brink of death by a life still in this world and of it from such a soul therefore our lover cries with the bitterest pathos of all have mercy on me o my friends in the words of my priest i can still perform actions of wonder and mercy in the lives of my saints i can live again a holy life on earth by every soul in grace i am at least tolerated and left in peace if not actually welcomed but in the soul of this sinner i am powerless i speak but i am not heard i struggle and am struck down attend and see if there be any sorrow like to my sorrow lamentations chapter one verse twelve 
behold i thirst john chapter 19 verse 28 there then is christ in the disguise of one who has rejected him number three now this recognition of christ in the sinner is the single essential to our capacity for helping the sinner we must believe in his possibilities and his only possibility is christ we have to recognize that is to say that beneath his apparent absence of faith there is still at any rate a spark of hope beneath his hopelessness at least a glimmer of charity mere pleading and rebuke are worse than useless we have to do on the level of our own capacities something of what christ did in his omnipotent love identify ourselves with the sinner penetrate through his lovelessness and his darkness down to the love and light of christ who has not yet wholly left him to himself we have in a word to make the best of him and not the worst as our lord does for ourselves every time he forgives us our sins to forgive his trespasses as we hope that god will forgive our own to recognize christ in the sinner is not only to christ's service but to the sinner's as well yet how pitiable is the failure of christians to understand this or at any rate to act upon it it is easy enough to persuade men to take part let us say in a liturgical function where christ is evidently honoured to adore him in the blessed sacrament to reverence him and his priests to celebrate the feast of a saint but it is terribly difficult to persuade them to engage in work whose material lies in christ's dishonour to support let us say rescue societies or guilds for the conversion of the heathen we are terribly apt to hug ourselves in our own religion to leave sinners to themselves to draw the curtains close to make small cynical remarks and to forget that a failure to recognize the claim of the heathen and the publican is a failure to recognize the lord whom we profess to serve under the disguise in which he most urgently desires our friendship look at the crucifix then turn and look at the sinner both are in themselves repulsive and horrible to the eyes of cold and godless perfection both are lovely and desirable since christ is in both both are infinitely pathetic and appealing since in both he that knew no sin is made sin 2 corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 for the crucifix and the sinner are profoundly and not merely superficially alike in this that both are what the rebellious self-will of man has made of the image of god and therefore should be the object of the deepest devotion of all who desire to see that image restored again to glory of all who pretend even to any sympathy with him who not only is the friend of sinners but chooses to identify himself with them to fail to recognize christ therefore in the sinner is to fail to recognize christ when he is most fully and characteristically himself all the devotion in the world to the white host in the monstrance all the adoration in the world to the stainless child in the arms of his stainless mother all this fails utterly to attain to its true end unless there accompanies it a passion for the souls of those who dishonour him since beneath all the filth and the corruption of their sins he who is in the blessed sacrament and the crib dwells here also and cries to us 
for help lastly it is necessary to remember that if we are to have pity on christ in the sinner we must therefore have pity on christ in ourself end of part two chapter nine